Welcome to this HP Expert One presentation. This is the second video explaining TCP and UDP, which are transport layer protocols in the TCP IP stack. In the previous video, we looked at the basics of TCP and UDP. I also explained port numbers. In this video, we're going to look at TCP options, including the SYN flag, the ACK flag, sequence numbers, sliding window, and flow control. TCP has various flags which are used to influence the data flow across a TCP connection. The SYN bit is set on when initiating a connection. It's used to synchronize sequence numbers and is only used on the first packet. The ACK bit is set on in acknowledgement of received data. When a session is first established, the initiator will send TCP traffic with the SYN bit set. The receiver of that traffic will then send back a SYN ACK and the initiator will ACK on the third packet. In other words, we have a three-way handshake in TCP. When initiating a session between A and B, A will set the SYN bit on or SYN flag to on. B will then set the SYN ACK flags on and lastly A will send an ACK or acknowledgement. So this is the famous three-way handshake in TCP. Before data is transmitted, TCP goes through a three-way handshake to initialize the session. Here's the same HTTP connection between my device 10006 and Google. Notice initially, traffic is sent from my PC to the server. It's TCP traffic. And notice the SYN flag is set on. If we look at the flags, notice all of the flags are set off except the SYN flag. Notice if we look at the sequence acknowledgements, this is an ACK to the segment in frame 104. In other words, that's the first frame with a SYN set. This is in answer to that frame, 104. Notice here, the SYN and the ACK flags are set. The server is indicating that it also wants to establish a connection with my PC. And now, notice the PC replies, this is an answer to the segment with sequence number 126. In other words, the server sending traffic to my PC and notice the ACK flag is set. So, TCP three-way handshake, SYN from initiating device to receiving device. In other words, my PC to the server. The server sends a SYN ACK back to my PC and my PC then sends an acknowledgement. Three-way handshake is then completed and notice now we can continue with HTTP traffic. So before HTTP traffic could be sent, TCP had to go through the three-way handshake to negotiate various parameters. The FIN flag closes a connection and the RST or reset flag aborts a connection in response to an error. FIN also indicates that there's no more data from the sender. A reset will tear down the connection. In this example here, notice my device is sending a message to the server with the ACK flag set, as well as the FIN flag set. In other words, I'm finishing the connection to the server. In this case, I close my web browser. The server sends an acknowledgement, as well as setting the FIN flag. And finally, on this connection, my device acknowledges that the session is gonna be torn down. Buffers in TCP allow for more efficient transfer of large files. Large buffers, however, can negatively affect real-time applications which require that their data be transmitted as quickly as possible. So the push flag allows the application to push data out immediately rather than waiting for additional data to enter a TCP buffer. It will cause TCP on the transmitting device to send the data immediately and on the receiving device to push the data to the receiving application immediately. 
In other words, rather than slowing things down by buffering on the transmitter and receiver, the data is immediately transmitted and on the receiver is immediately pushed to the application without buffering. So on my Wireshark capture, my PC is connecting to the web server. Notice the SYN flag is set. Server's replying with a SYN ACK. My PC is sending an ACK. And notice here, it's sending data using push and ACK. So we have the TCP three-way handshake taking place. And now HTTP traffic is sent from my PC to the server. The push flag is set to indicate to the TCP process on my machine that the traffic should be sent immediately and to indicate on the server that the traffic should be processed immediately. The traffic that I'm sending to the server is an HTTP GET message connecting to server google.co.uk with various information about my device. So in summary, the push flag does two things, tells the TCP process on the transmitting machine to send the data immediately and tell the receiving device to push the data up to the receiving application immediately. The urgent flag can be used to indicate that this segment is urgent and should be processed as soon as possible. So the receiving device knows that certain data should be prioritized. This is used in combination with the urgent pointer, which indicates how much of the data in the segment is urgent. However, the urgent flag isn't used much by modern protocols. The congestion window reduced flag is part of a congestion notification mechanism used in conjunction with the echo flag or echo congestion notification echo flag. This is used in congestion notification, which can be used in quality of service where the hosts communicate to indicate congestion, thus letting the transmitter know that it needs to slow down. Now let's talk about sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers, which can get fairly complicated and are often confusing. The sequence number is a 32-bit number and each device involved in the conversation maintains this 32-bit sequence number to keep track of how much data it has sent to the other side. The sequence number is included in every packet and is acknowledged by the receiving device, which indicates successful receipt of the data. Now in the past, TCP sequence numbers could easily be guessed and thus session hijacking could occur. To stop that, initial sequence numbers are now random. However, when we look at our Wireshark capture, this is the initial connection from my PC to the web server. Notice the sequence number is zero. Wireshark is showing the relative sequence number. However, in the ASCII decode, we can see the number in hexadecimal, 14312B4E. Putting that into a calculator and converting that to decimal, you can see it's a very large number. So Wireshark uses relative sequence numbers to make it easier for us to read what's going on. So let's work through this conversation. Device 10006 is communicating to google.co.uk. The first step is the three-way handshake. So my device initiates a connection. The relative sequence number is zero. Notice the flag set is SYN. The acknowledgement number is also zero because there's no other device involved in the conversation at the moment. When the server replies, Notice SYN ACK, second part of the TCP three-way handshake. Notice the sequence number the server is using is also zero. This is the relative sequence number once again. The actual sequence number is listed here in the ASCII decode. This is the server's first segment that's part of this conversation. The acknowledgement number is set to one. This indicates that sequence zero was received and the next expected sequence number is one. The third part of the three-way handshake looks as follows. My device is sending traffic to the server. 
the sequence number is 1 and the acknowledgement is 1. So my device is sending a segment with a sequence number of 1 and it's acknowledging receipt of sequence number 0 from the server and is now expecting sequence number 1. This is the first packet carrying actual user data. So notice the protocol is HTTP. So this is the first segment actually carrying payload information. Scrolling down, we can see here that HTTP data is being sent to the server. You can see, for example, the host being requested is google.co.uk and some other information is included here, such as the language. So, the sequence number is left at 1 since no actual data was transmitted since the last packet. The acknowledgement number is also left at 1 since no data has been received from the server. This payload, notice bytes in flight, is 699 bytes in length. So my device is telling the server that the next sequence number is 700. 699 bytes of actual data has now been transmitted to the server. The server replies, notice here, acknowledgement to the segment in frame 130, where my device sent 699 bytes to the server. So we've got an acknowledgement to that frame. Notice the acknowledgement is 700. In other words, the server is informing my device that it successfully received 699 bytes of data. The server sequence number is 1. No data has been transmitted from the server yet. So continuing, we can see here that the sequence number is 1, as once again no data was previously transmitted, but 1430 bytes of data are in flight. So the TCP segment data is 1430 bytes. So the server is informing my device that the next sequence number is 1431. It's still acknowledging receipt of 699 bytes of data. Thus the acknowledgement number is 700. The next segment has sequence number 1431 which was given to the client in the previous segment. So going to entry 143, sequence number is 1431, next sequence number is 2861. The client hasn't sent any more data to the server, so the acknowledgement number is still set to 700. The client now acknowledges receipt of the data, so the acknowledgement number is now 2861. Its sequence number is still 700 because it hasn't sent any data to the server. Going back here, you can see that the bytes in flight is 1430-2860. So the client is acknowledging receipt of 2860 bytes of data. It has successfully received 2860 bytes with an acknowledgement number of 2861. That is the next number that it expects to receive. Continuing, the server sends more data. So the sequence number here is 2861. The next sequence number is 4291. Bytes in flight, 1430. Acknowledgement number to the PC is still 700. 699 bytes have been received by the server. Continuing, Notice sequence number is 4291, next sequence number is 5721. Bytes in flight, 2860. The client then acknowledges with sequence number 5721. Previously, remember here 2860 bytes were in flight and previously 2860 bytes were in flight. Therefore, 2860 times 2 gives us 5720. So the client is now acknowledging receipt of 5720 bytes of data. 
It's acknowledging with an acknowledgement number of 5721 to indicate receipt of 5720 bytes of data. Its sequence number is still 700. Now this will continue. Here's the next one. Sequence number 5721. Next sequence 7151. Acknowledgement number is still 700. The client hasn't sent any more data to the server. Here we've got 7151. Next sequence number 8581. Bytes in flight 2860. The client then acknowledges with an acknowledgement number of 8581. Once again 2860 times 3 is 8580. So the client is acknowledging receipt of 8580 bytes. And this will continue on and on and on. I'm hoping that at this point you have a good understanding of sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. Sequence numbers allow a client to keep track of data that's been transmitted. Acknowledgements from the receiving device let the sending device know that the data was received successfully. The window size is a 16-bit value which specifies the size of the receive window, which is the number of bytes that the receiver is currently willing to receive. TCP can use something called a sliding window to control the flow of data. Windowing would allow a receiving device to advertise how much data it's able to receive before transmitting an acknowledgement to the transmitting device. In each TCP segment, the receiver specifies in the received window field the amount of additional received data in bytes that it's willing to buffer for the connection. The sending host can only send up to that amount of data before it must wait for an acknowledgement and window size update from the receiving device. Now you may be wondering, why is the server sending data in multiples of 1430? Notice here it says TCP segment of reassembled protocol data unit or PDU. Here once again, it's in a multiple of 1430. You can see that here, notice the length 1430 and looking at the first segment, length is 1430. Why is the server sending a maximum of 1430 bytes in a segment? This is because of something known as maximum segment size or MSS. The MSS is the largest amount of data specified in bytes that TCP is willing to receive in a single segment. The reason for this is to improve performance. MSS allows us to avoid IP fragmentation. So the devices want to send segments that will be smaller than the maximum transmission unit or MTU of an interface. The maximum transmission unit is the maximum frame size supported on Ethernet or other media. So with MSS, TCP wants to ensure that there's no IP fragmentation. So it wants to send segments that are smaller than the MTU of an interface. In the negotiation, right in the beginning, this is the initial connection, notice the SIN flag. Scrolling down, we can see maximum segment size. In this case, my PC is advertising a maximum segment size of 1460 bytes. The MTU on FOST Ethernet is 1500 bytes, but this ensures that the data is small enough so that the data and the headers can fit into 1500 bytes. However, on the server, the maximum segment size is set to 1430 bytes. Thus the server is only going to send data to the PC with a maximum size of 1430 bytes. As you can see here, going through the various segments, maximum length is 1430 bytes. This one as an example has a length of zero because it contains no data. This is just an acknowledgement from the client for data received from the server. Window sizes can be used to implement flow control. This prevents the issue 
of a sending device overflowing the buffers of a receiver. So the sending device is sending data too quickly for the receiver to receive it and process the data. This may be because this is a powerful device and this device is not as powerful. Or device B may be very busy. So flow control allows device B to slow the transmission of device A. Here's an example to explain sliding windows and flow control. Host B in this example has a buffer of 2048 bytes. In this example, let's assume that host A sends 1024 bytes to host B. Let's use a sequence number of zero to keep the math simple. Host B can buffer the 1024 bytes because it has space in its buffers. Host B will then acknowledge receipt of 1024 bytes by acknowledging with a number of 1025. Host B also indicates to host A that its window size is 1024 bytes. So host A can send 1024 bytes to host B. When that arrives, host B can buffer the data, but now its buffers are full. So it acknowledges receipt of 2048 bytes, but sets the window size to zero. That means that A should no longer transmit data to B. When A receives an advertised window size of B, it once again does not transmit any more data to B, but it also starts a timer called the persist timer. If that expires before receiving an updated window size from B, A will try to recover the session by sending a small packet so that the receiver, in this case B, acknowledges with a new window size. When buffer space becomes available, in this example only 1024 bytes are used, B is able to let A know what the new window size is. So in other words, B can use sliding windows to reduce the speed of transmission of A or to stop transmission of data from A, which gives B time to process the data received. That concludes this video discussing the transport layer protocols TCP and UDP. For more information, please go to hp.com forward slash go forward slash expert one.